Um, I will echo the thanks that everybody else has given um, to uh, everyone who made this possible, to the organizers and the staff. Um, I'm delighted to be back. I actually uh, had a postdoc here at Pembroke oh, eight, nine years ago. Um, and so this is a kind of uncanny return for me. Uh, my word is contingency. Contingency from the Latin contingere, con together, tangere, to touch, is the name for the encounter of shared space, time, and recurrence that asks us to read for articulation in the fragment, presence in the trace. The gathering point of contact, contingency testifies to the power of affiliations and desires that do not map necessarily onto the individual, sovereign subject, liberal political project, or for my interests, the post-colonial nation state. Historical contingency, as Walter Benjamin calls it, is the past as it, quote, flashes up in the instant when it can be recognized and is never seen again, end quote. It breaks open progressive historicism's parable of wholeness and development that has consigned the post-colonial world and its representative feminine subjects to the waiting room of late capital. Freeing us from the overdetermined the overdetermination of post-colonial failure, contingency makes way for what Eve Sedgwick calls a reparative reading practice, one oriented towards touch as accretion, accumulation, and resolvedly still interruption. This is an ethical orientation as much as a theoretical one. Let us say then for the purposes of today, that contingency is a structure of reading for the post-colonial condition, one which maps through contact which announces by way of strategic indeterminacy that which might have been and thus yet may be. This talk will, I hope in some tangible ways, perform the uncanny contact of contingency, repeat its startling, fleeting, discontinuous mode rhetorically. For this reason, I will offer three scenes of touch. Individually, there are accounts of political possibility, of tactility as a practice of nation making. But to read together, contingently, they suggest that in eruptive political and historical moments, affiliations and investments come into being, forms of a kind of libidinal upsurge in which not all cathexes will prevail, but out of which radical possibilities appear in moments that Durkheim calls a collective effervescence. These moments refuse progressive teleology. They will start, stutter, skip, get caught in the groove of the historical record. Here, I resist the romance of nostalgic resignification and also the dismay of traumatic repudiation. Implicit instead is the conviction that even as these forms of attachment do not take on institutional lives, they do not die away that their appearance as interruption, excess, and incoherence illuminates an alternate vision and lived possibility of what constitutes the political. One, I touch myself. In the 1920s, when Mohandas K. Gandhi began to solidify a political project of anti-colonial resistance, he turned to an ideal of purification through tactile labor, weaving a material and metaphorical nation out of self-touching. The spinning of cotton thread at the charka, the spinning wheel, became a symbol of a growing nationalist movement, and Kadi, handloom cotton, now holds pride of place in a post-colonial imagination. Even as the failure of Gandhi's vision of an egalitarian nation state bound through exertion and tactility becomes ever more, sorry, the failure of his vision becomes ever more violently evident, today more than ever in Modi's India especially. Gandhi, though, also embodied not just the nationalist cause, but the very terms of his political strategy. His emaciated form, toiling away at the handloom during his many hunger strikes, grew in ideological prominence inversely to its corporeal degeneration. Satyagraha, as a political project, depended on the ability of the masses gathered around him to access him, to touch him, and to in turn be touched by him. Indeed, Gandhi responded to what he saw as a hyper-masculine violence of colonialism with an explicit self-feminacy, an identification with the mother in the motherland. Engaging icons of women's household labor as a mode of self-determination, Gandhi produced an idiom of gendered protest and marked women as vehicles of political protest. 
The hunger strike, which would become the most spectacular sign of Satyagraha, recoded the intimate domestic act of protest as political, referencing the familiar, familial sign of women's refusal to eat as resistance to familial conflict, disengaging the object over which they had definitive control, that is, their bodies. Passive aggression is transformed by Gandhi into militant passivity. Affecting this transformation made way for a new political subject whose material labor might be useful to the cause of independence as her affective labor also was. The material produced by that labor, particularly handloom cotton, is also the object of national futurity. Photographs of Gandhi with the charka, particularly here this Margaret Burke White image, made so iconic on the front pages of Life magazine in 1946, carefully position the body of Gandhi and the machine of the loom so he does not actually spin or even touch the loom, but rather sits proximate, sharing the space but not interacting. The unmoving and untouched loom in Burke White's photograph stands in the foreground, its spokes and filaments leading the eye to the photo's emphasis, which is Gandhi's body in the background of the image, one hand gripping letters, the other wrapped around his own foot. He touches himself twice over in the image, hand to foot and hand to correspondence in his name, but touches neither machine nor thread. The shared space of the photograph constructs Gandhi and the loom as related but distinct. The Jarka defers the image focus to Gandhi, man superseding even the imagistic force of the machine. At 76, the caption reads, the Mahatma is in good physical condition. He weighs 110 pounds, but is not so frail as he looks, end quote. Image and text collude to focalize and buttress the body of Gandhi as the unflagging engine of the anti-colonial project, whose seemingly enervated form belies his ability to labor at the loom and for the nation to come. In the public international imagination curated by Life magazine, M.K. Gandhi, the man, is manufactured into Mahatma, who is machine, his human form central to the charismatic possibility of Indian anti-colonialism. Gandhi's nearly bare body, the dhoti and occasional shawl, a truncated smear of white across his form, stands in for indigenous post-coloniality, untouched by the, either the fabric or the fashion of the foreign body to be disgorged from the nation state to come. Thus, it is not what Gandhi wears, but the ways in which his body exceeds the cloth that is supposed to be its determinant. The frailty of his body in this image is strategically figured as superhuman. The production of Gandhi as symbol trafficked in the spectacular subjugation of his body as a thing disappearing and disappearable. Part of the promise of this logic was that the Gandhian project could outlast and surpass the limits of his mortal form because his personality didn't require such corporeality. The materialist bent of Satyagraha, the very material of its production, had already absorbed into its thread the traces of the immaterial force of Gandhi. Handloom cotton produced on the charka was valued because of the contact with the human hand as a very artifact of tactility itself, touchable. Aesthetic value here is inexorably sutured to the touch of hands. It is precisely this effort and contact between body and fiber that also rendered the act of spinning and the object of its labor an object of desire and of regeneration. The value of Kadi revealed, its way, revealed itself by way of its touch. Unlike machine cotton, Kadi's texture, coarser with a broader weft and warp, and insistently irregular, does not resemble the skin on which it lies. Its artifice, artifice is exposed by its manufacture. This texturally conspicuous and tactily aggressive Kadi of the 20th century may have sought to actually distinguish itself from contemporary milled cotton, but in doing so revealed a larger discontinuity between it and a prior indigenous handloom, the muslin of which 30 yards was said to weigh less than three ounces and fit neatly inside a matchbox, which was once loomed at an unthinkable 1800 thread count. This fabric, far more diaphanous than the skin on which it rested, is in the most base ways recalled by the even 19th century power loom cotton that came to utterly eradicate it in the market and as a technology. If Manchurian, Manchesterian 
cotton becomes the doppelganger of human skin. We can think here of Calvin Klein, nothing gets between you and your Calvins. Um, if that is a doppelganger of human skin to which Gandhi and Khadi refuses to aspire, the Dhaka muslin is a spectral trace of that, that haunts the possibility of what fabric might be. It has, by way of a deep material colonial violence, come to be lost as a practice. There is no more fabric that was once called woven air from East Bengal, but its promise and lingering trace of the touch on flesh haunts the fabric of cotton spun relentlessly in the Satyagrahan imagination, as does too perhaps a stain of amputation's blood. The rumor is that this cotton disappeared because the British had uh, the thumbs of master weavers amputated. So hand looming as an indigenous practice by the 1920s comes to be expressed as rudimentary rather than artisanal by way of a future anterior tense. It will have been that Kadi is some imperfect replica of skin and cotton both, its tendons severed from the touch of muslin, a muslin thread. Although Gandhi insisted in his writing that Kadi's value was ex as an aesthetic and commercial object was growing in the early part of the 20th century, it proved itself to be a difficult commodity because of the market forces that followed cotton away from Taka to Manchester. The very aspect that rendered Kadi so valuable, the traces of human labor, are also what made it basically incongruous to the needs of the poor to whom it sought, to his up, sought uplift. The expense of Kadi in both energy and money rendered it impossible for the rural poor, and its appreciable irregularity, the markers of its technological primitivism, rendered it undesirable for an urban elite whose sartorial affinities were of a global and imperial economy. Today, of course, Kadi has secured a niche market for itself, especially in India, a vouchsafe of bourgeois nationalist taste, particularly it's in its curation by retailers like Fab India, which traffic in upscale indigenous handicrafts for both the domestic and foreign market. That old muslin, woven by Muslim artisans, derived its value in the marketplace for the ways in which its material characteristics seem to exceed and eclipse the technology and the labor that produced it. That is to say that the body of the artisan that did not render, was not what rendered the cloth valuable. In the 18th and 17th century, it was the value uh, that was obscured by the body, in fact. Unlike Gandhi and Kadi, the desirability of Dhaka muslin was displaced from the manufacturing body of the weaver. The gossamer thread needed to weave it was a far cry from the coarse yarn produced under the conditions of the box jerka. Those who chose to wear Kadi, wear Kadi in the nationalist period appeared to do so in defiance of the terms of beauty, comfort, and work normalized by coloniality and its widely limbed international interdependencies of economy and aesthetics. For Gandhi, the labor of spinning cloth by hand at once drew together a national body in a kind of Andersonian logic through shared work, through the shared touch of hand to fabric, regardless of class or caste. It produced a common uniform to lay upon that national body, and it produced a ritualistic purification, a self-purification by touch. This is a vision of a project that does not require the touch of another, rendered here colonial, colonial and machinic. It holds on to the ideal of autonomy as a kind of self-touching. This cotton cloth, unadulterated by the contact of either foreign hands or foreign machine, is itself pure. The tactile labor of fabric production and the contact between that pure material and the purified body. Masturbatory labor, a deep if unspoken pleasure derived and fulfilled by one's own hand and touch, turns a conventional nationalist narrative inward, away from the reproductive motherland whose feminine body is the condition of future possibility and towards a touch between hand and cloth, the skin of the self to manufactured skin. But contingency here, the claim for a political and economic life constituted by touch, is caught in the context in which interdiction against touch is also the basis of the social world. In Bengal in particular, the question of untouchability fundamentally skews not towards Hindu and Muslim or within Hindu castes, but across religion. Touch prohibition, the bodies cast beyond the touch of the hand, posed an intimate problem for observant Hindus and their Muslim neighbors. 
To be rendered untouchable is to be forced outside the bounds of what constitutes not only the human, but the bearable. Skin is not in the state of untouchability, the possibility of encounter, but the very promise of its absence. In a place as dense with bodies as Bengal, the interdiction against touch is a particularly acutely repeated social violence. But how then, with such very close proximity, can we imagine, as Gandhi asks us to, an uncontaminated life in the world? The very fabric of social life bears already the touch of bodies marked as taboo, which are then formed and maintained by the labors of untouchability. Bengal weavers, officially all men, though women's work is essential to the production, who spun the gossamer thread and loomed the diaphanous Dhaka muslin were Muslim, clothing a Mughal court and Hindu zamindaris alike. Though some Hindu scriptures suggest that artisanal craft is untainted and that, quote, the hand of the artisan is always pure, end quote, the communion between fabric and flesh cleaves the language of purification and containment. No encounter of such proximity is untainted, nor can it be sanitized. In the pantheon of laborers whose bodies are beyond the pale of touch, but whose work is necessary, on the other spectrum from the artisanal weaver are the laundry or dhobi workers. Weaving as a highly venerated artisanal craft produces its own economic language of exoneration, as its object is one of beauty, of value, of use. Dhobi work, on the other hand, is a vilified but essential labor that maintains and makes possible the material life of cloth. The process of cleaning cloth is in fact, though, a perfect vehicle for the transfers of trace of the dhobi body onto the fabric itself. The porosity of cloth promises that it retains and absorbs the skin and sweat of laboring hands that caress it and ensures that it carries back to those residues to the skin of its nominal master. For this reason, in the 19th century, the technical term used by English tailors for wrinkles caught in cloth was memories, proof that it had been inhabited by the human form that cloth preserves its encounter with the body. Kadi meant to lie on that Indian body formed in indigenous skin. It's an ideal vehicle of not touch towards purification, but of the refusal of possibility of purification. Cloth catches in its fibers that which it touches, which turn come to constitute it. The fabric of spinning as purifying self-touch is a reification of intimate contact. Thread and cloth manufactured on the charka is contaminated in the ways that foreign cloth on the power loom are strangely not, with the immutable and eradicable traces of prior contact with the human form. Embodied in the warp and weft of cloth is a possibility of a kind of radical alterity that comes from the contingent contact between bodies making the world and the nation anew. We might then think of cloth as a vehicle of an intimate politics in which freedom comes not from the ideological expulsion and repudiation, but from a fleshly accumulation and contact. Two, touching me, touching you. Not everything is a lyric, but maybe. Uh, in 1971, nearly a quarter century after the assassination of Gandhi and the partition which would make Bengal two states of two separate nations, we return to the promise of touch and textile. This crowded feminine machinic scene of textile work captured by Jill Sabella at a rehabilitation center in Dhaka in 1972, reframes the integration of body and machine, imagining anew that Margaret Burke White photograph of Gandhi at the Charka. Following the widespread and systematic rape of women during the Bangladesh War for Independence, the government established a rehabilitation program aimed at women who had been either displaced during the war or having been subject to sexual violence were unable or unwilling to return to their families. The decree by Bangladesh's first president, Sheikh Mujib, that women raped during 1971 be called Birongonas, war heroines, and offered compensation for their war labor, syntactically compressed sexual violence and military heroism into a recuperative national femininity, valorized and sanitized. The word Birongona, from bir meaning heroic, can either mean heroine or hero's wife. In Bangla, the word is actually um, unfortunately stalked by a near homonym, which is barongona, which means prostitute or feminine body that is forbidden. That body is a body that you have to avert your gaze from, the touch of which is forbidden. The distorted echo of the two names 
appear throughout claims that contest accounts of women who came forward as having been subject to sexual violence during the war. To call them prostitutes was to assert the limits of what could have been grieved and incorporated into this new nation. To suggest then that women were, had consented and were compensated was also to forestall the possibility of their bodies being recoded as those of national heroes. In the name Birongona and its echo, the sanitizing celebration of violence against women as acts of valor is conspicuously undercut by the proximity to a repudiated female body, to that which you cannot touch. The double connotation echoes back to the work of the rehabilitation centers to first somatically and psychologically purify these bodies, and then to produce them as subjects of a new nation, to shift them out of the camps back into the domestic sphere, going so far as to offer dowries to men who came forward willing to marry them, and or into the realm of economic productivity. Social worker Malika Khan notes that much of the initial handicraft work at the rehabilitation center was a kind of occupational therapy of intimate muscle memory. Rather than speak the words of what happened to them, women would take into their hands the objects of a prior life and be physiologically reminded of what preceded the war. But instead of spinning thread by hand on a nation building charka of the Indian post-colonial project, these newly post-colonial Bangladeshi women take into their hands the metal machine that traveled from America to the subcontinent and was propagated through one of the earliest installment credit programs, the Singer Sewing Machine. The latter-day life of the sewing machine in Bengal is one of reuse, of semi-commercialization, and of wage labor. When the Women's Rehabilitation Training Foundation offered training in mechanical stitching, it did so on used machines who had been donated during the war. Once found in the hallowed spaces of the home, these machines reappeared in the hands of women whose access to the domestic space had been imperiled. They were part of a vocational training program, each of which asked how a simple machine might open up new economic possibilities for women, again, echoing the Gandhian project. Unlike embroidery and sewing training, which was figured as artisanal and reparative, the tactile practices of a genteel life, sewing machine training programs oriented themselves to a public world of industrialization and the possibility that women might enter into the workforce. The efficiency and speed offered by the machine made it a gateway into the formal economy for women, not just those trained in centers, but more broadly, an evolution of the spinster into a new body of this new nation. Unlike the singular photograph of the iconic man, instantly recognizable, in glancing contact with the archetypal machine, this is an cr image crowded with bodies in contact with machine and each other. Though the sewing machine is central to the mise-en-scene, it nearly vanishes in the shared space between the three women on the ground. Cloth fed through its needle draws the continuous line to the white sari of the woman whose hand blurs in motion at the flywheel. That unstitched white cloth that drapes across one woman's body slips and binds her to the women around her. Together they create a white space of contact that surrounds the machine's black metal form. The women in dark saris, both standing, suture together in their sh shared shadow. These women, unnamed and unrecognizable by the camera, are a very different image of national futurity and purity than the emaciated man spinning his thread alone. Their bodies are subject to a purifying machine of the nation that will transform the violence done to them into war labor and produce them as viable vessels for the work of reconstruction and restoration. By way of their shared touch of body to body, of body to machine, of body to cloth, another politics of post-colonial possibility might be articulated. Those porous objects suffused with particles of flesh and of recollection draw together a new national body, body like the Kadi that Gandhi 50 years earlier hoped would weave together a common filial fabric, the textiles made by these displaced women bound together bodies both valorized and that the nation hoped to disappear. The sewing machine is a crucial technology here in Bengal, a, tra a transitional one, a metal hinge between artisanal hand looms and industrial garment factories. Indeed, its popularity announces the textual slippage away from the irregular weave of hand loom by way of the rise of Manchester mills towards cotton cloth, which is at once affordable and uniform. Mill cotton made way for broadcloth, jersey, modal, and denim, which now women stitch on Singer sewing machines inside the factory space. The shift also allows for the entrance of women into a formal economy, 
Whereas weaving has traditionally been men's work, women contribute significantly to spinning and stretching thread, but not to loom work. Imperial textiles invite the touch of women's hands. It also presages the scene of contingency for Jataka, once famed for ethereal muslin, is now known. Three tangents. In 2013, Drick, a visual arts agency in Taka, undertook the ambitious project of conjuring from centuries of extinction the storied muslin for which the city was once famed. In attempting to retrieve muslin to restore it to a Bangladeshi nation and a global economy, Drick encountered a paradoxical allure. Its value as a commodity derived from the enigma of its becoming, the irreconcilability of the technology of its manufacture, and its actual object life. How could cotton spun by hand and woven on bamboo come to be finer than gossamer, so diaphanous as to almost disappear, and yet so durable as to outlast the memory of its making? Hyper-artisanal, muslin, though handmade, disappears the body of its manufacturer. The same year, just 20 kilometers away in Savar, the Rana Plaza commercial factory collapsed, killing nearly 1,200 garment workers inside. The sixth major disaster at a Bangladeshi garments factory, Rana Plaza, is to date the deadliest factory incident in history. Images of the demolished building and of the casualties circulated in the international media, galvanizing consumer outrage in the United States and the United Kingdom in particular, where the majority of the cloth made in these factories was sold at Gap, H&M, and Walmart. Vibrant cloth here in this uh, image by Taslima Akhtar, the concatenation of manufactured apparel and clothing on human re remains is laminated onto concrete rubble, a final fusion of labor to commodity. Because the garment sector is credited with Bangladesh's recent economic rise and signals the potential of the country to wean itself off of an international aid apparatus, the predominance of the women's bodies at Rana Plaza embodied for a consumer public in the global north the gendered cost of cheap cotton knit. Like the historical taka muslin, contemporary machine cotton bears in its fiber the somatic sign of touch from its manufacturer. Far tighter in its warp and weft than its handwoven kin, this cotton does not announce its proximity to the manufacturing body, as did muslin or Gandhi. Those fabrics, by design, distance the textile through their touch, muslin to ethereal for human skin, kadi markedly rough, even as they vouchsafe in their name the historical trace of the hand. Mill cotton's technological feat is it so closely resembles the skin on which it rests. Ready-made, as these garments are called, um, have actually disembodied in the same way that their local predecessors have. No human hand appears in the image of these machinic, ubiquitous textiles, once again sharing the cloth and labor from the site of its manufacture. But in 2013, the rupture of disaster announces the hands that make these so-called ready-made garments. The fabric produced by contemporary garments work then only exists alongside hand-woven uh, fabrics in the most disavowed ways. Its alleged distance from the touch of the hand, its industrialized and mechanized anonymity is precisely what quantifies its labor value so inexpensively. The name bears a promise that a machine, not human, manufactures the clothing and allies the elides the strenuous physicality of the process. Disappearing the presence of the body suggests a kind of magical process by which garments don't have to be created as they pre-exist themselves. This is a different kind of supernatural textile than muslin two centuries earlier. Gandhi proclaimed quite proudly in 1925 that Kadi was beloved for its tactility and an object of even greater beauty and value than its prior imperial kin, muslin. Their kinship is manufactured through a shared sensorial evocation of beauty, pleasure, tactility. But we do not speak of contemporary garments work in aesthetic terms. Their mass reproducibility and mundane circulation recall neither the work of the, mar the master artisan or the communal singularity of the atelier. There is no space in the tight weave of knit fabric to ask after intentionality or desire the terms that we have for aesthetic critique. Indeed, aesthetics demands a consideration of desire in its technical psychoanalytic sense as that which connects to an object outside the self. 
It is for this reason that I turn to textiles as a site of political articulation. The contemporary life of ready-made garments, apparently devoid of art and beauty, appears to be one in which only a failure or lack of political agency can be de demonstrated. But in what we might call a contingent reevaluation, I want to suggest that there is a tangent touch between these fabrics, muslin, khadi, and machine cotton, fed through a Singer sewing machine and an industrial cutter both. A shared contingency between the bodies that manufactured them, that is, made them through the touch of the hand, between women whose labor and dispensability produced the fabric and possibility of the post-colonial nation state. This fabric, made through and for human touch, politically constitutes a relationship not just between the bodies of Birongonas and Gandhi and garment workers, but in retaining the t trace of that touch between the poorest lives that make it and thus, thus us who wear it. This is a form of global contact that orients itself to an ethics of attachment made possible by intimate contact. In the tactile encounter between skin and fabric, there resides a possibility of imagining out otherwise what a shared life of political possibility might be in the face of our own materiality. Thanks. <laughs>